Good evening. I'm Justin Silverman of the New England First Amendment Coalition. Thank you so much for joining us in our annual celebration of the First Amendment and the public's right to know. We have an inspiring program for you tonight. We'll be honoring a New Hampshire resident who used her public records law to uncover illegal activity among government officials. A local newspaper that successfully battled at city police department in court for three years. And the executive producer of one of the most prestigious investigative journalism shows on television. In a moment, NEFAC President Karen Bortolo will tell you a bit more about our coalition and update you on our recent work. But first, I want to thank some of those who help every year with our First Amendment advocacy, defense, and education. Thank you to the Boston Globe, Hearst Connecticut Media Group, Paul and Ann Sagan, the Robertson Foundation, WBUR, the Academy of New England Journalists, Jeannie Gannett, Linda Henry, and Connecticut Public. We wouldn't be able to have the impact we do without all of your support. Thank you again. Now, here's NEFAC's Karen Bordelow. We are delighted that you are here to help us honor this year's mighty defenders of the First Amendment. Frontline executive producer Rainey aronson Rath, the Worcester Telegram and Gazette, and New Hampshire resident Tara Gunnigal. Before we begin, I'd like to give a big shout out to the students and student journalists from our sponsoring colleges and universities. Boston University, Emerson College, Franklin Pierce University, Northeastern University, Roger Williams University, Syracuse University's The Tele Center for Free Speech, and the University of Rhode Island. These students are joining a community of dedicated journalists, lawyers, and educators who lead the charge to ensure that democracy not only survives, but thrives. That democracy flourishes, not only in the West, but across the globe. And that democracy prevails over tyranny. That brings us to the mission of NEFAC. NEFAC was formed in 2006 by a group of journalists from Providence and Boston who were concerned that citizens and reporters in New England were being denied access to public documents and public meetings despite access laws. These founders decided together that they must deliver the message of open government in one united voice. They decided that together they would effect change, that together they would shine a light in the dark corners of government. And 16 years later, that is still our mission. We make that happen in three ways. Through education, from our 30-minute skills session, to our investigative journalism institutes, to our training videos, to our mentorship program. We help journalists do their jobs better. We also have a strong community outreach program. During the past several years, we have organized and participated in more than 150 civic programs on the importance of free speech, and free press. We do it through advocacy. We speak out on behalf of reporters and citizens who have been illegally denied access to government documents. And we help government agencies develop fair and transparent access policies. And finally, defense. NEFAC gives public testimony and provides free guidance on access issues to citizens and journalists alike, student journalists included. In closing, I want to thank NEFAC's Executive Director, Justin Silverman, for his tireless work on behalf of the First Amendment. Without him, this award ceremony and NEFAC's important programs just wouldn't happen. I'd also like to extend my deep gratitude to the members of NEFAC's Board of Directors who donate their time and energy to the cause. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce NEFAC Board Member, Janet Wu, who will present the Antonia Orfield Citizenship Award. This award is given each year to a New England resident who has fought for information crucial to the public's understanding of its government. This year, we are honoring Tara Gunnigal, a Webster, New Hampshire resident who, with the help of her husband, John Pearson, investigated a suspicious sale of property in her town. Tara's story begins in September 2020, when the town treasurer in Webster mentioned during a public meeting that he owned two plots of land across the street from his waterfront home. At town board meetings, Tara began asking tough questions about the properties and how they were sold by the town to the treasurer. She requested that the board unseal the minutes of the 2019 meeting when the sale was approved. She also used the New Hampshire right to know law to file public record requests for town documents related to the sale. What Tara uncovered was an illegal sale 
of two one and a half acre lots by the town to the acting treasurer for $7,000. It is a class B misdemeanor to buy town property while serving as a public official, unless there is a competitive bidding process. And in this case, there was not. The discovery resulted in the finding and resignation of the town treasurer and helped to, as Tara puts it, quote, get dirty politics out of her small town. Said Tara during the town meeting, quote, if you have no facts, you have no truth, and then you have no trust. The New Hampshire state constitution guarantees a government that is open, accessible, accountable, and responsive. But that transparency and accountability can only occur if citizens, citizens like Tara, demand information about our representatives and fight for their right to know. Now to accept this year's Antonia Orfield Citizenship Award is Tara Gunnickel, along with her husband, John Pearson. Hello, everybody. Thank Hi. you very much. In an already whirlwind of a year for us, we were very surprised to receive a call from NEFAC to let us know we were being awarded the Antonia Orfield Citizenship Award. She was quite an amazing woman with big footprints to fill. We would like to graciously thank all of you who chose us out of all the deserving people from the whole of the New England states. We are certainly humbled and very grateful. Who knew that small townies like us would be in the spotlight for using the First Amendment to bring transparency and accountability to elected town officials regarding their illicit backdoor dealings. We must mention the Concord Monitor's super reporter, Cassidy Jensen, who helped us achieve our goal by reporting the findings of the 91 A's we received, which led to the arrest and conviction of a former selectman treasurer in our town. The First Amendment gives everyday Americans like us the power to stand up for our rights, be it a small town like ours or a city. It helps keep an eye on our elected and volunteer governments to keep them honest and for the people, not for themselves. While we received much credible information from the 91 A's, we also found out how much information we didn't get. Empty files, erased computer files, and I don't know. We were told to look up past selectman meeting minutes, which were highly edited. The First Amendment is clear and very easy to use as it should be. Using it ensures the country's future as our founding fathers intended. Free speech, free press, peaceful assembly, and the very important freedom of information through 91A to petition for transparency in our government's doings. Don't give in and don't give up. Stand your ground and don't be bullied. Be informed of your rights. We did amid adversity and were successful. Our founding fathers through the constitution gave us the greatest gift in the world. Honor them and all the Americans who sacrificed their lives for it and for us. We owe it to them. Our veterans have fought and died for the stars and stripes of our flag the symbol of our constitutional rights. We must not let anyone take them away. Our First Amendment, freedom of speech, opens the world to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for, for everything, for the award. What a great story. Congratulations again, Tara. From the right to know law in New Hampshire, we now move south to Massachusetts. Despite improvements to the state's public records law in 2016, it can still be a challenge for Massachusetts residents and newsrooms to get information about their government. That was the case for the Worcester Telegram and Gazette, who in 2018, led by reporter Brad Patrician, requested internal affairs records of officers working in its city police department. The request was made two years before the killing of George Floyd and as highly publicized police shootings were just beginning to give renewed scrutiny to local law enforcement agencies. The Telegram and Gazette believed that the information in the documents it requested would help readers better understand whether officers in their own community were being held accountable for their actions. At first, the Worcester Police Department agreed to provide the Telegram and Gazette more than 2,000 pages of records, but for nearly $4,000, a steep price for records that are public under the law.
But making matters worse, the department later changed its mind about the records. It said it would release and now would keep most of them secret instead. This secrecy, the newspaper believed, was a violation of the state's public records law. The people of Worcester had a right to know what was in those records, especially given multiple and recent criminal cases involving Worcester police officers. What made this violation especially egregious is that in 2003, the Telegram and Gazette won a landmark legal ruling against the same police department for the same types of records. The records were necessary, the court said, to build confidence in police investigations and to help keep officers accountable to the communities they serve. Said the paper's attorney, Jeffrey Pyle, quote, it's like Groundhog's Day with the city arguing these points over and over again. Yet, despite this legal precedent, the Worcester Police Department continued to withhold the records, beginning what would become a three-year legal battle between the newspaper and the city. During this time, Patrician spent countless hours reviewing court filings. He produced more than a dozen stories covering the case, and he did all this even as city officials made baseless personal attacks against him and his newsroom. The Telegram and Gazette would ultimately prevail with a major public records win. A Worcester Superior Court judge last year ruled in favor of the Telegram and Gazette and earlier this year ordered the city of Worcester to pay the newsroom's legal fees. In a stark rebuke to the police department, the court even imposed the first award of punitive damages in a public records lawsuit since at least 2016. The decision reaffirms our right to police misconduct records, and it stands as a warning to all state and local agencies who favor secrecy over transparency. It is a reminder that in a state like Massachusetts, where there is little recourse to fight public record denials, sometimes we need to dig in and battle hard for information. The Telegram and Gazette did just that. Receiving this year's Michael Donahue Freedom of Information Award on behalf of the Telegram and Gazette are the paper's executive editor, David Nordman, reporter Brad Patrician, and attorney Jeffrey Pyle of Prince Bell in Boston. Congratulations to you all. Woof, 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 woof. Right. <laughs> on behalf of the uh, Telegram and Gazette here in Worcester, um, you know, thank you uh, so much for this, uh, for this award. Um, it really is, um, you know, the most important uh, part of our job uh, defending uh, the First Amendment. Um, I'm not going to take up too much of uh, your time. I, you know, really owe this award uh, to all of the uh, the reporters, Brad sitting next to me here, uh, and, and Jeff, um, you know, one of, and I've said this before, one of the best uh, First Amendment lawyers uh, in the business uh, anywhere. So um, thank you very much for this award. Um, you know, like I said, it is, uh, it's an honor to receive it. So I figured we would have a quick lawsuit that would result in a complete win and the newspaper would get the records fast. Well, the newspaper got all the records, but it didn't exactly get them fast. It took three years and a trial, but ultimately the newspaper prevailed. And as a result of this, we now have the first ruling applying the punitive damages provision of the public records law to a records custodian because the judge held that the city of Worcester acted in bad faith when it withheld these records. Thank you, NEFAC, for recognizing the Worcester Telegram and Gazette for bringing this important case. It's my hope that lawsuits like this will make our public records situation in Massachusetts better than it is right now. Public records laws really only work well when the government fears lawsuits. And I hope that this lawsuit inspires other news organizations to bring public records cases like this one to challenge all kinds of withholdings that continue to happen in Massachusetts every day. When we fight, we win. So I, I'd just like to thank NEFAC for this, for this great honor uh, and this important award. Uh, you know, I think everything going on in the world today, it's never been more important to celebrate, um, you know, people upholding our democratic ideals in this country. I'd also like to thank Jeff Pyle, who just did amazing work. Uh, we could not have filed this lawsuit and prevailed, obviously, if it wasn't for him, uh, for him seeing this for what it was from the beginning and saying that I'm gonna help you um, prevail uh, to right or wrong. Um, also, uh, just on a personal, personal note, just like to thank my mom, Deb Patrician, who 
was here with us when this lawsuit was filed and isn't is not here any longer. It was not here, unfortunately, when it concluded. But uh, she inspired me every day to keep doing the right thing. Uh, and she always did the right thing. And so, you know, I just want to say thanks to her. Um, you know, doing what's what's right is important. And that's what we were trying to do with this lawsuit is to stand up for the truth, stand up for the ideals that we hold dear here at this newspaper. And so uh, for you to recognize us for that means very means a lot. All right. <laughs> now, the presentation of our Stephen Hamlet First Amendment Award, given every year to an individual who has promoted, defended, or advocated for the First Amendment. This year, we honor Rainey Aronson Roth, executive producer of Frontline. Rainey, congratulations on your First Amendment Award. It is so well deserved. Thank you for producing rigorous accountability journalism in the public interest about all of the stories around the world that impact us all so deeply. I really want to acknowledge and appreciate that you are helping to change the face of who gets to tell investigative stories. And just as importantly, you are expanding the notion of who gets to be at the center of those stories. That is game changing for so many of us. And I am just eternally grateful to you for your mentorship, for your inspiration, for your leadership, and maybe most importantly to me personally for your friendship. When I first met Rainey, I remember that stepping into the offices on Guest Street was like stepping onto the deck of a battleship. The temple of production, the marathon fact check sessions, the wall of Emmys staring down at you. I was a scrappy independent filmmaker and this was Frontline, a legendary institution. Needless to say, I had my doubts. The whole place thrummed with energy, but I feared that energy was the whirring of a machine that would round off the edges of my film to make it fit neatly into their weekly slot. And then I met Rainey. I'm not sure what exactly my expectations were, but she confounded and surpassed them. Rigorous and diligent and careful, of course, but Rainey's eagle eye for story, her genuine curiosity, her desire to engage and understand the world rather than just editorialize around it, those were truly special. And her bravery, not just to take on hard stories or upend conventional wisdom or go up against dangerous villains, but her willingness and readiness to change, to turn on a dime, to turn this whole battleship around if the story demanded it. That was truly inspiring. Under Rainy Frontline isn't a machine. It's a team on a mission, defending journalism in a moment when it's under attack and always pushing forward the boundaries of storytelling closer and closer to its beating human heart. Hi, Rainy. Um, and everybody here to celebrate Rainy. Um, my name's Don Porter and I'm a documentary filmmaker. Um, I had the joy of working with Rainy. Uh, she asked me to come in and work with her on the Unresolved Project, which grew and grew and grew. Um, and I got to see her legendary um, work ethic up close and personal. The thing that uh, just astounds me about Rainy is uh, she is tireless um, and always positive, even under a lot of stress. She's ethical, she's honorable. Um, she's just the kind of leader that you want to have behind you when you're doing the hardest work you can imagine. I've been working with Frontline for many, many years and on many, many films with Rainey Aronson. I remember when she came to me and asked me what I thought uh, about her moving to Boston from New York, uh, where she was living and working at the time, and joining the executive staff there, uh, the editorial staff at Frontline. I said to her, I think, if, if I remember correctly, uh, that it would be a lot of work. Uh, of course, I didn't know Rainey that well then, and but anybody that does know Rainey, that would not scare her. She has brought enormous energy uh, enormous commitment and an enormous amount of passion to the job at Frontline, and she has expanded the series in so many ways. Uh, I, I'll, I'll say this about working with Rainey. She allows you an enormous amount of freedom to tell the story that you feel committed to telling. And she won't hover, she won't meddle, but when you're finished, when you present a rough cut to her, she will rigorously uh, question you as to whether or not you've made the, the best possible arguments you can make um, for, for the film that you're presenting. 
Today, it's very special to pay tribute to a woman that I truly admire and love. Rainy and I forged our career at Frontline many moons ago, and of course today she's my boss. As a boss, she is one tough person. She is demanding, exacting, rigorous, just so impressive. She has more energy than anyone I've ever met. As a person though, she is caring and generous, a cork of enthusiasm in the midst of difficult times. I am so proud of you today, Rainy. You have led us through treacherous times as journalists, where we are attacked for what we do and where truth is confused with lies. I have to say, you have always been on the right side of history. You always stand for what matters. Rainy, I'm so pleased you're being honored with this award. The First Amendment often gets used as a shield to defend prejudice and the lowest expression of humanity. But you, you're always reaching for the highest expression of our principles and for our highest aspirations for society. Through your leadership, you've demonstrated what it looks like to really consider how we represent the public in public media, not just in the stories we tell, but from whose point of view and who participates in the reporting and editing and producing and presenting of those stories domestically and around the world. Your commitment and tireless work are an example to all of us working to uphold press freedom. Journalists in the United States face rising levels of hostility. I would say unprecedented levels of hostility. And I have personally experienced this uh, due to my work with Frontline and ProPublica. My family's been doxxed, we've been hacked, we've been robbed, we've been threatened. We've had to leave our home repeatedly. We've needed armed security at times. And there are two neo-Nazis currently serving federal prison sentences because of their campaign of harassment and abuse directed at me and my family. And I'm telling you all this because throughout it all, Rainey has done everything she could to protect me, protect my family, to safeguard our lives. And this is the hard work that she does that people never hear about. This is what happens behind the scenes that you don't know about. I'm thrilled that you're being honored. Congratulations. And I look forward to all that the future holds and all the incredible work that you're going to produce. Enjoy. Congratulations, Rainy. It continues to be an honor to be a part of your team. Congratulations to you, so well-deserved. Um, and here's to doing more great things. I can't think of anyone that deserves this honor more than Rainy Aronson. You are a true inspiration. Congratulations. Here's to you. I think people like myself are very, very grateful to get to work with someone like Rainy. It's wonderful to be together this evening and to be the recipient of the New England First Amendment Coalition Stephen Hamlet Award. I have read so much about Stephen Hamlet through the years and to think that my work resonated with you all regarding his was deeply meaningful. It's also given me a moment to reflect, of course, on the importance of the First Amendment, but also how the First Amendment and accountability journalism work hand in hand. Of course, without the First Amendment, the work that we do at Frontline, that investigative journalists do in the United States would not be possible. So I also wanted to thank all of you at the First Amendment Coalition for your hard work to protect the First Amendment and essentially the work that we do in journalism. It is a partnership with you all. I also wanted to say that it gave me a moment to reflect upon my own career and where it all started. So I started as a young reporter in Taipei, Taiwan. I was working for a local newspaper there and I was just a cub reporter. What was happening in Taiwan at the time, however, was profound. It was the first time that the people of Taiwan in the mayoral elections were voting. It was a democracy that was forming right in front of my eyes. As a young reporter, I remember the excitement. I remember the absolute tears in the street when people voted for the first time in their adult lives. It was incredible to see that energy. And then also as a reporter with a deep curiosity about fairness and equity, I started to ask questions that we are still asking today here in America, of course 
questions about access, questions about equity, questions about whether or not people had the ability to go and vote. I remember writing these stories at the time with so much energy and passion for the form of journalism, which is to be a record for what I was seeing, but also the ability to ask those questions and be curious enough and skilled enough in the questioning of people to be able to get to the bottom of things. One of the things I learned there was that those very questions promoted change and questions from without journalism, and that was deeply gratifying at the time. I wanted to say that as a young journalist, I have a lot to be grateful for. I had a terrific editor who I'll never forget, and I also had really supportive parents. I look back, and I'm a parent now of two teenagers, at the decisions they made to allow me to go to Taiwan in the very first place. Their belief that as a journalist, I would be very much um, satisfied there, but also curious enough to make my way was really everything and gave me the confidence I needed. And I have to say, both of them who are not journalists, that's a brave move on their part to believe that I would be fine out there in the world. And I took that to heart as a young person and also this very moment. I also wanted to say that, you know, frontline journalism, the journalism in general that we practice, doesn't happen without lawyers, journalists, of course, producers, directors, and editors, and also without the support of public media. We would not be who we are today without the support of WGBH and, of course, PBS, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And I have to mention that the work we do at Frontline is fiercely independent, but it has the support of public media and always has. I'm carrying on that tradition, but the foundation is there. And it's a strong one, and it's a really, really important one when you think about the world in which we publish. I also wanted to thank my incredible family, my husband, Arun Roth, who is a journalist, and my children, um, Arjun and Mira, who are really the light of my life. And of course, around our dinner table, you know, questions range from how do we get to praxis tonight all the way to are your journalists safe mom who are operating in Ukraine? These are grave and important questions that my kids ask around the table and support the work that we all do. So I'm deeply grateful to them for their curiosity as well, and also for their support, and of course, Arun's. So most of all, I wanted to thank all of you at the New England First Amendment Coalition for this award and for honoring me with it, and as an extension, the work of Frontline and all the really amazing journalists who are in my midst. So thank you again. Rainey, congratulations on receiving the Stephen Hamlet First Amendment Award. It's well-deserved. Thank you. I'm a little bit overwhelmed. I didn't know you were going to have so many incredible people speaking about me. I just have to like take a moment to say thank you again. That was amazing. So Rainey, I wanted to pick up on the question that your children were asking you at the dinner table. Are your journalists safe in Ukraine? You know, the Committee to Protect Journalists reports that seven journalists have been killed in Ukraine this year. So can you talk about the courage the reporters are, are showing in reporting on the invasion and how you can try to ensure their safety? Well, I'll start with your the last part of your question first. I mean, I would say that, um, you know, everybody running news organizations today, and you heard E.C. Thompson talk about it even, has to think about um, safety constantly. So it's not just in Ukraine, it's also in the United States. He spoke about doxing and the pressures he's facing now um, with white supremacists. And I think that the, the key difference is that People who now are operating in Ukraine have to go in with the most serious security um, that's possible. So Frontline is a very small team right now that's in Ukraine. Um, I'm fortunate to work at GBH and with PBS, and both institutions really believe in resourcing us in security terms. CPB does as well. So we have the resources to send our teams in with, with the right security. That said, they're operating in a war zone. It's always something that we offer as an option. We never force. Um, and we spend a lot of time talking about scenarios in which um, you know things can go wrong. And as you said, seven journalists have been killed. Um, there's a lot of journalists operating in Ukraine and around the world right now. 
Um, and it's, it's a very serious time right now. We have a great security team that does risk assessments for us. Um, and I'm very involved as well. So is our senior staff. So all of us think about this, you know, day and night. And so that's why my kids know about it because, you know, Ukraine is, is a number of hours ahead, of course, and, and oftentimes in the middle of the night, we'll, we'll be hearing things. I was also struck by the threats that Frontline and ProPublica reporter A.C. Thompson talked about. What are some of the dangers that reporters are facing here in the United States and, and what can be done about that? Yeah, I would say it's a great question. Um, I would say that starting about five or six years ago, um, we started to consider domestic reporting as serious as we did international reporting in security terms. So if you were attending rallies, if you were reporting on white supremacy, if you were reporting on anti-Semitism, racism, all of these issues, uh, we considered that high risk. Um, and what AC Thompson has been doing, of course, is reporting on, um, starting with Charlottesville, really documenting the rise of hate in the United States of America. As he mentioned, it's really his story to tell. You know, his story, his story is one that, um, you know, his family has been attacked, his um, livelihood, and, uh, and that's because he's doing investigative journalism in the public interest. We're identifying people at rallies that perhaps didn't want to be. That is, um, you know, something that we need to do. We need to document. We're, we're people who need to hold the record here. It also means that journalists who do that type of reporting are taking on extra risk. Um, and I would say everyone in journalism right now feels that way. It's, it's not necessarily just um, in the area of doing that specific reporting, but reporting in general right now. Um, is something that we, we just have to think through every single time we're out in the field now. World Press Freedom Day is coming up on May 3rd, and Reporters Without Borders will again provide a map showing all, where the press freedom stands around the globe. So can you give us uh, provide your perspective on how free the press is around the world right now? I mean, I would say we're all very concerned. Um, we did a really um, important, I would say, important film called A Thousand Cuts with Maria Reza, featuring Maria Reza's work in the Philippines. Of course, we all know her now as the Nobel Prize winner. What the real truth of the matter is, you know, the company that she founded, the journalists in the Philippines, um, they increasingly saw the freedom of the press restricted there in the Duterte era and continue to see restrictions today. You see restrictions in Hungary. You see them all across the planet right now. Um, and to some degree, what I think Frontline's job is right now is to document that as well. And importantly, to work with international journalists. So one of the most powerful tools that we have right now is to actually work with international journalists in a way that we never have before. So we have a big project around the Pegasus Project, which is really an important international collaboration, but increasingly we're finding ourselves reaching across to people who are working, investigative reporters in Mexico, in places where it's really difficult. It's more difficult than working here. And we're trying to amplify their work. Going back to the Philippines, one of the things that we experienced with A Thousand Cuts, that film was, they simply couldn't get distribution for that documentary in the Philippines. So what did Frontline do? I just had this idea, it was a late night idea that maybe what we should do is actually distribute it ourselves on YouTube in the Philippines. So we did. And mm. you would not believe the hundreds of thousands of people who watched a thousand cuts in the Philippines because wow. they had access to that. So that is powerful, right? If you think about it. Their own press can't show that, right? Rappler, the group that Maria Reza founded does, but it's a really, really important way of saying, we need to think creatively about how do you get factual journalism, not just here in America, but internationally now. So our scope is much larger than it was um, just a number of years ago because of these restrictions across the globe. You've talked about how a mentor once told you corruption doesn't show its face. But at the same time, there are fewer and fewer journalists out there holding people in power accountable. So what happens when newspapers shut down and communities end up in, in news desert? What news deserts? What fills that void? Well, thank you for doing your homework, first of all. <laughs> that was one of the most uh, clarifying moments for me when one of my mentors said that. And I thought, that's the purpose. That's why I'm on the planet. Like, 
you know, pure and simple. I'm a mother and I'm a journalist. And actually, you know, that that is the concept that I hold near and dear, which is that, you know, if you don't have journalists and communities, then what do we know what's really happening? Um, so we all know what's happening to local journalism. In fact, I was on the Knight Commission with the Aspen Institute looking at that very issue. And again, what I, I walked away with is something very important. When local journalism is decimated, as we see now, does not have a business model. Trust in journalism break down, breaks down across the whole spectrum of journalism. It's not just national and local anymore. It's just this idea of journalism. There's a lack of trust in it, right? We don't know a fact from a fact. It's very difficult right now for people to decipher what is really the truth. And one of the things that is a big breakdown in, in America and can really hurt our democracy is this problem at the local level. So I'm hyper-focused right now on local. Um, in fact, we received a, a really generous grant from CPB and also the Knight Foundation to start funding local journalists. Again, with this idea towards, we wanna be part of the solution, we're not the only solution, but we're now working with five local newsrooms and some of our most profound journalism now is coming out of these local newsrooms that we're supporting financially and editorially, and we're collaborating with them and then we're sharing their stories. But I would say it's something we all need to pay attention to, and you all are doing that, you know? Yeah, you mentioned you were a member of the Knight Commission on Trust, Media, and Democracy, and one of the recommendations in that report called for journalists to practice radical transparency. Yeah. So tell us about what that means and what Frontline uh, did in that regard. Well, it's an interesting story. So Mizell Stewart and I were, were um, the, the folks who came up with that terminology, and the idea was... So to build trust, how do you build trust? One thing is to not assume that you have it in the first place. And I think that's very hard for legacy media to actually think about the fact that not everyone trusts what they say and to think instead about how can you build trust? So at the center of radical transparency and why we, we use that terminology was to think out of the box about how you might start to build trust. So Frontline, what we do, and every news organization is different, is we do something pretty radical. And the journalists in the room and the lawyers all know why this is so different. We actually open up our long form interviews. So not just what you see in the film, not what's been edited, but actually the real conversation that occurred. The thinking behind this, right, was that if we could show you the edits, if we could show you the actual conversation, then you watch the documentary, right? You would be able to say, you can judge for yourself, were we fair? Were we tough enough? And that was the idea behind this, this big transparency project that we launched, actually with Putin's Revenge, which is a big film a number of years ago, where we said, well, if there's any territory we need to be transparent about, it would be on Russia and Putin. And we were right, right? So we started to publish this, I have to say, because I'm hoping Dale Cohen's listening mm -hmm. in. Dale Cohen is our special counsel. You cannot do this work without copious work from lawyers and also from um, our editors like Andrew Metzler and Azell. You know, these folks are reading everything before we publish this. So it's seen as a an act of publishing. And why I say that is because, you know, you can't just release um, a conversation if there are factual errors, right? You can't release it if somebody's libeling someone, right? So you have to be very careful, even in the landscape of, you know, so-called radical transparency to make sure that you consider this an act of publishing. And this is really what we do. It's been great. I, I would say one of the things that is counterintuitive is that we did this really as a trust building exercise with we thought would be a smaller audience in fact, people love these interviews. They watch them. They watch them on average for 20, 25 minutes. Sometimes we see millions of views for these interviews. That isn't just really not expected. And it's it's oh. a thrill to see people kind of, you know, coming under this tent and saying, hey, I want to see what this is. I want to understand journalism and the actual conversation. It's really, really inspiring to see the, the audience. That, that commission also said that all Americans must possess civic and media literacy. So yeah. what are some concrete things? Do you talk about that with your kids? What are some concrete things to do to become more uh, media literate? 
So I, I definitely think it starts in the home. I really do. I know, I know that that's not realistic in, in some cases, but I do think having a conversation with your children about the media that they are um, watching is really important. You know, I've often said, and I see this with my own children and other people's children, that if you think about it, the youth of today are having the first unmitigated experience with media. They are watching what they want to watch. They have full access to the world and we're not with them as they're watching. You know, if you think about our media consumption as grownups, our parents were there. I had very little, in fact, myself, but I'm saying like, even if I had, my father would be there, my mother would be there. There would be somebody there to talk to me. And in fact, I can remember those conversations. What our children now have with their iPhones and access to the internet is their own experience that they don't know how to uh, differentiate. So a lot of work that we do at Frontline is taking what we do. And I know this sounds, um, it sounds a little bit boring, but it's really important. But we take our work and we work with our PBS Learning Media folks, and we actually break it down for people in the middle school and high school. So teachers use our journalism and teach it. And I'm hoping, and I see this happening in our school, but not all across America, you know, conversations about media literacy, trusted sources, where do you get your news from? These conversations are starting to happen, but, you know, it's not too late, but it's it certainly, we've been slow at the wheel here. You know, we need to get going with, with this part of the conversation, I think. You also talked about the value of WGBH and PBS. So can you give us the state of, quickly the state of the state of public media in this country? And can you address what, what's going on over in Britain with attempts to cut the funding for the BBC? Yeah, I mean, the, the BBC, I, I can't really comment on other than to say that it is, um, from our perspective, uh, we work with the BBC a lot. We see value in their journalism, and their clear eyes and their fair and, and really serious journalism. So, so we're concerned about what's happening there. Um, public media right now in the United States is decently funded. Our funding is, um, I wouldn't say secure, but it's steady. Um, I would say that the thing that we have as a strength in, in the public television side is our stations. We have 330 stations across America that continue to contribute to what we call the National Programming Service. So that is uh, shows like Frontline. It's also shows like Nova, the incredible show about science, right? It's American Experience, the history show. It's all the big shows. So the stations support us to do our work through PBS, right? bit of a complex system, but it works. Um, the, the other big benefit for public media is it's non-commercial, right? So Frontline, for example, is in front of all paywalls. This is really important to access, right? So we, not only are we in um, people's living rooms on television, but we're also streaming. So one of the really big benefits to something like the landscape we're in today, from my perspective is, Millions of young people see Frontline on YouTube, on PBS's streaming platform. So it's not relegated only to the broadcast, right? It's beyond broadcast now. And you would be surprised. The numbers on YouTube of younger people in their 20s and 30s watching us are amazing and extraordinary. And they have conversations about the content. They watch for over 20 minutes on average. This is really encouraging about, you know, younger people who are hungry for fact-based journalism. I just have to say, I mean, I've been really optimistic seeing what's happening now in a streaming environment. That's great to hear. I mean, the, you, you mentioned the skepticism, people suspicious of, of the press. It's such a polarized political atmosphere. How, and you're presenting objective investigative journalism. How do you handle coverage of hot topics like, uh, you know, you, you took on the spread of the belief that the 2020 presidential election was rigged? So that's a great question. We're just professional journalists and editors. This is the best way to answer it. We have a process that is journalistic. And what we do is we vet every single thing and every, um, like for example, you mentioned the plot to overturn the election. We were able to, with ProPublica, to identify a small group of people who actually had a plot to overturn the election. We had documentation. We had, we had not just interviews, but we had backup interviews. We had multiple sources and we go through a process where, you know, the truth of the matter is we only say what we know, we don't go, even an iota farther, and that is our process. And you heard people talk about like, I'm so tough. Well, I'm tough on the facts, you know, and that's one thing I am tough about. Like I may be very nice, 
but you know, it's almost like my belief in science. It's like, you know, you have to believe in processes and you have to believe that there's a way to get through difficult territory with facts and with vision and not be swayed by either side, but to think hard about what we can really say at frontline. So we're investigative. I think there's a benefit to that. Um, I think if I was running like a breaking news outfit and you had to bounce between people's point of view without thought, that might be very difficult, but we have the benefit of time. So that's something that I'm going to always protect um, at Frontline is time to make good decisions. You know, we all know that, right? That if you take a little more time and you think more thoughtfully, you come to a better decision. So this is what we do at Frontline day in and day out. The editors at Frontline are tireless. We have a fact checker. You never want her to fact check you. Trust me. She <laughs> knows everything. She is an inspiration. This is Kate Weiwert. She is truly like, and Lauren and Andrew and Dale know this, like she is really an outrageously good fact checker. And she just cares deeply about us getting it right. And we emphasize at Frontline that that's the most important thing we do. So cinematography, yes. Storytelling, yes. I love that. I'm a filmmaker, but it's actually journalism and facts. And that's what, that's what we're about. You talk about being a cub reporter in Taiwan. So I wanted to ask you what advice you would give to young reporters and to the journalism students listening tonight. Yeah. What, do you, what do you know now about journalism that you wish you knew at the University of Wisconsin? Oh, I mean, nothing more, actually. I'm like, I just love the field, right? So I just love the challenge of it. Every single day, I'm approaching it with fresh eyes and with um, the feeling that we have to get it right and do better. Every single day, every hour of my life is all about that. And I would just say as a younger journalist, there are a couple of things I did right. And it was as simple as practicing journalism, leaving my apartment, going places, seeing the world, being a journalist in the world, going to Taiwan. You know, I didn't know I was going to experience a democracy unfold. And that's what I got to witness as a young person with my own eyes. I wasn't reading about it. I wasn't on the phone. I was in the streets covering it. And that is my biggest piece of advice. Get out of your apartments. I know it's hard. COVID was pretty challenging. So I don't mean get out if it's dangerous. I mean, you know, when it's safe and you can do it in a secure way, try to go and practice journalism and in all the forms that you hope to do. So I was a writer back then. I became a filmmaker. But, you know, if you can pick up your camera, pick up a camera, pick up your pencil, but make sure that you uh, take notes. That's one thing that I was never really good at is taking notes. So that's why filmmaking was a more... Um, was a terrific medium for me because I was filming it because I was never the best note taker. So I think, you know, see where your strengths are and go in that direction and what you love to do, you know. And when you're hiring new reporters, what are, what are the qualities or, or the skills that you're looking for? I mean, the first thing I'm looking for is curiosity. Hmm. I want people who are actually curious and don't think they have it all figured out. To this day, I know I don't about literally anything. And that's why we're still good at what we do. We are curious every day. Did we get it right? Are we thinking hard enough? Did we think about the so-called other side? Did, are there facts that we haven't thought about before? Is there new information that we haven't found? So someone who's naturally curious, you can just tell those types of people. The second thing is fairness. Is a person fair? This is really important to me at Frontline. Are you thinking in a fair way? Again, that comes down to this idea of being open-minded enough that you might be wrong and report against your assumptions, report against yourself until the bitter end before you publish. You better know every argument against what you're trying to make, or you could be wrong. So that's what I like in a person. Skill sets, you know, it's great when younger journalists have data skills. You know, I really love people who know how to, you know, um, have those investigative skills now um, that can help us amplify the work beyond the character. And that's something that we look for. Uh, one of our listeners uh, says they're really interested in reporting on war. So the question is, what and how can we go towards that? How can we go towards that direction when uh, we're not present on the ground? Yeah, that's very difficult. I would say that um, that's a great question and, and one that's hard to answer. The current stage, especially as dangerous as it is in a place like Ukraine, we're tending to use people who have prior wartime experience. But I will say there's a couple of younger people on our team who don't. And what we've done with them is 
uh, and this is what happened to me in my career, is in my 20s, when I was working for ABC News, I was not sent to a war zone. I really wanted to go, but I was put in charge of other elements of the reporting, like, and it sounds very mundane, all the production um, managing, all of the um, organizing of travel and keeping people safe. I learned those skills in my mid twenties. And when my boss said, I'm sorry, I'm not sending you to Kosovo. I'm not sending you to these places. I said, that's okay, what can I do? Hmm. And that's my best piece of advice. Like ask that question, what can I do? And the closer you get to this work, the, the closer you'll be to being sent and you will get sent if you keep at it. That's, that's really my best advice. And another listener wanted you to talk about some of the ethical dilemmas you face while reporting on war and the discussion you have in the newsroom for those dilemmas. I mean, there's dilemmas all day long. One of the biggest dilemmas we have had was last year when we were doing a big film out of Afghanistan. We started filming before the United States had pulled out. And we had a series of interviews with um, women who were talking very openly about their situation in Afghanistan. Um, When the US pulled out and we hadn't aired our film yet and um, the United States, you know, as we all know, pulled out and uh, conversations were starting to be had about the Taliban, what their their approach may be uh, towards women's rights. We went back to those women um, and said, are you comfortable with your faces being on camera still, because it's a different regime now. Like, Hmm. how do you feel? And we didn't just go with like the prior consents, right? Legally speaking, we were covered, but we all decided at Frontline, we had to go back to every single individual who had spoken to us because it had been a huge change. Most of the people decided to continue to um, wanna speak out, but in a couple of very important cases, People took, um, you know, a different approach and just asked politely, you know, please blur my face and disguise my voice. And we respected their choice. And that's something that we think about all the time. When you're putting people on camera, think hard about who they are, what risks they're taking. Make sure you have informed consent. Really, really important. Um, And we'll never get it totally right, but you hope that you get it right again with that thoughtful process around it. Uh, One question is, what's your message to news managers more concerned with their financial bottom lines, fearful of lawsuits from the subjects of investigative pieces than they are about exposing illegalities? Well, my first piece of advice is hire an amazing lawyer, you know, <laughs> like actually work with you all and figure out what 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 actual intellectual talent you need at your side to publish investigative journalism. So I, I do believe that. Um, Filmmakers and news organizations that do not have sophisticated legal help and editors uh, should be careful with publishing, right? It is such a litigious environment now. So Frontline is blessed with the resources to do that. However, I knew that I needed them as a news leader, right? So I knew I needed someone with, um, you know, Dale Cohen's experience and knowledge and expertise, I just knew that. And so we hired him. So I would say your first piece is like, look around at your your leadership. Is there someone there who understands the First Amendment, understands libel, understands all of these issues that we face today in a new environment, right? As publishers and people who are journalists. Um, If you don't, maybe that's where you start. You suggest, how do you build a small team? How do you, and it could be very small at first, and very righteous, right? And then you can build out from there. But we're really, we really take this issue very seriously. In fact, Dale and a lot of the work he does now at UCLA is training filmmakers who don't have this background, don't understand the law. You know, I, I had the benefit of going to Columbia where I studied the First Amendment with some of the best, you know, legal scholars. So it's in me as a leader, but a lot of people don't have that training. Um, and you need that if you're going to do this type of work. And, and what would you say to the aspiring young journalists at Roger Williams University and all these other colleges around New England that are tuned in about why they should go into journalism? Why should they choose this profession? Okay, so that's a great question. I mean, I, I can just say with my perspective, you know, now being, you know, a couple of decades in, uh, it's a really gratifying career. I feel like I'm, I'm doing something that's meaningful, that's giving voice to people that don't have voices. I say it's very hard work. Um, The other thing I do say is, and this is not to be discouraging, but it's more to just be real. If you don't love this work, 
consider other work that's meaningful. And I talk a lot with my kids, not about like what makes you happy, but more about what do you find meaning from? And actually those were conversations I had with my father, you know, when I was young, what gives you meaning? What, and my mom too, it's like, what, what is going to give you personal meaning? And journalism for me was the answer, right? Um, and for some people, it's being a teacher, a doctor, you know, a leader in another, another industry. But, you know, if you love journalism, start practicing it, make sure you love it and then just keep going and you'll find your way. Excellent way to end it. Rainy, Aronson, Ross, thank you for talking to us tonight and congratulations. All right. Thank you so much.